My name is Patricia Wirakun, and I'd like to talk to you about nurturing the cyber generation. The first thing to do is to learn who are these, this cyber generation we're talking about. These are what we also call the iGen. Have a look at that picture. Is there something strange about that? These are two kids who should be out there playing together. But they're sitting, facing away on their devices. This is the move from the play-based childhood that we grew up in and the phone-based childhood of today. The Gen Zs, who are your teenagers, born between 1995 and 2010. They grew up in a time when smartphones were introduced and they came of age in the iGen. Then we have the Gen Alphas. Gen Alphas born into the cyber world, born 2010 and after. We don't have a lot of information on the mental health of Gen Alphas, but we do on the Gen Zs. And what we see is as in this graph, there is a spike in the psychological distress around that 2010-2012, especially in females, but in males also. Not just in Australia, in New Zealand and many other countries, we see this spike in mental health. What happened around 2010 and 2012? This was the time when kids went from flip phones through to smartphones. And therefore, they became the most virtually connected, socially aware, advertised to and sexualized generation that ever walked the planet. They also, by virtue of being continually linked, they became the most lonely and antisocial generation who ever walked the planet. And for us Christians, they are the ones least likely to stay on in church. So what I'd like to talk to you about to start off is a little bit about your children and how they got here to this point. Three points I want to discuss. Your children with a vulnerable brain immersed in social media of the cyber world in a postmodern, post-truth culture. Let's start with the brain. The children's brain is extremely what we would call neuroplastic. The brain is a work in progress. You know, the brain is largely got the number of nerve cells and neurons in it when the child is born. But during development, there is a reforming of these circuits in the brain. And there's a loss of neurons. We call it pruning. Nerve cells and pathways that are used are kept and the ones that are not used will be lost. It's a kind of use it or lose it process. What is fed into the brain will establish the circuits, the values, the attitudes and ultimately behavior. That's one important point. The second point is that there is what we call a developmental dissonance in brain development. The brain doesn't kind of go poing, all mature together. It kind of matures in a back to front, inside out. The first part that matures is the emotional brain. The brain that erupts at puberty. The brain that says, I want independence, my own identity. 
I want novelty in life. I want instant rewards. Mom, dad, auntie, uncle, grandma, don't tell me wait 10 years to see results. I want it in 10 seconds. This is the world I live in. I want to take risks, especially when my friends are around. I want to do things that are exciting and get my friends approval. I'll keep translating this to what's happening online. And of course, being puberty when the brain erupts and interest in sex. Oh, that's all very good. What's the problem? The problem is that the part of the brain that is involved in decision making, the higher center, the control, this kind of prefrontal parietal lobe doesn't mature till the mid 20s. So about 25 years old and the control brain still developing. So what have we got? When a teenager is faced with a decision that is exciting and risky and their friends are saying all doing it and it becomes this social thing the emotional brain takes over not the thinking brain they need to understand this first about our children you know philippians 4 8 says whatever is good and pure and honest and beautiful think on these things we call it neuroplasticity what are the children feeding their brain? They are feeding their brain on social media. This is called the great rewiring of our time. Children's brains fed with just quick bites of information on social media, be it TikTok or YouTube or Instagram or social media platforms for chats like Reddit and Tumblr, what they get is quick fixes of what's called dopamine, the excitement chemical. It hijacks their brain chemistry. It provides them these quick fixes and it manipulates appetites, the algorithms, pick an interest. If you watch one porn video, you're going to get lots and lots and lots more and very, very quickly. This is the way your the children's interests are channeled. And this results in not being able to concentrate. So you have fragmentation of attention. Sit in class. You're more interested in what's on your smartphone. So you're not paying attention. And then you rush home and if you're a boy, you get on your video and your video games. If you're a girl, you're seated with your smartphone, checking on who's done the latest thing. You're isolated, you're sedentary. You're leading a virtual life, unable to function in the face-to-face -face relationship. So what is happening? You are isolated from reality, resulting in anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, those things we looked at. And you are lost in this world of cyber fantasy, pornography, video games with avatars that draw you in and say, maybe you are an avatar. The ease of sexting and sharing explicit pictures, making children vulnerable to what is called sextortion. And watching the influencers on YouTube and uh, TikTok and Instagram and wanting to be like them. Girls in a comparator culture, boys in the video games in a competitive culture, always finding that they're somehow falling short. And all these psychological problems that come out of them cyberbullying, pornified behavior, all this, and finally, even addiction. And we can see that in the data. Data shows us that the association between heavy social media use, 
and poor mental health. Just look at that. Girls more than boys. Boys too. The more time that is spent on the phone, the worse the mental health. And even more interesting, and that is that when you start a child early on a smartphone, the less psychologically fit they are in their 18 to 24 age group. So measured around 18 to 24, kids who are given phones early in life are far less psychologically complete human beings. What does this tell us? It tells us about the danger of what kids are feeding their brain. Moving on. So, kids with a vulnerable brain immersed in a cyber world of a cultural moment of post-modernity and post-truth. A culture that has moved from a time when we believe there was some outside authority which had a right to tell us how to live our life, morality and meaning in community, in family, in God and church, to a place where our feelings, our desires determine everything. So it's a desire driven radically individualistic autonomy that our children live in. My life, my desires must be met to be happy and content. No resilience to take the hard knocks of life because they never had to. They were protected by their parents and grandparents. And so it is my right to get whatever I want, when I want it, as soon as I can, and social media is going to give it to me. So we have an aggressive selfishness where sex has become a commodity and it's just there. I use it like something from reject shop and throw it away. But it is also my identity. When I have nowhere else to look for identity, I look in to find out who I am. I find my sexuality and that becomes my identity. And even my body becomes incidental and can be molded to my pleasure. What can you do? Encourage and empower parents to be the primary sex educators of their children. Yourself, be involved. Be that auntie, that uncle, that grandma, that grandpa, who is a role model to the next generations to come. Where appropriate, listen, be the one who the children come to and share your stories with them, your life, your problems, how you develop resilience. Now, when we go back to our churches, encourage your church to tackle the tough topics. And think. You can probably think of many, many other ways you can help the children. One way is to give the children a better narrative. You have the word of God. You have the story. Tell the children God's good story from creation, Genesis chapter 2, when Adam and Eve brought together naked, no shame, Adam's excitement when he sees Eve, all the beauty of man and woman created in the image of God, male and female. Talk about the 
power and the place of sex. Talk about re revelation where Christ and the church, his bride come together. Talk about Song of Songs where the woman sings. My love is as strong as death. It's jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like a blazing fire. Explain this blazing fire has to be protected, not put out there to create a bushfire. Talk to them about 1 Corinthians 6 and how beautifully the body is represented as Christ's own body, the body that belongs to Jesus the home of the Holy Spirit and how to honor God with their body, give them a better identity. Ever created by God, chosen and known by God. When King David wrote, you knit me in my mother's womb, that beautiful knitting and known by God, redeemed, and chosen to call God Abba, Father. Give the children the excitement of this. You have it, now share it with the generations to come. Now, in our rest of our time together, I want to just talk about three applications but I'm going to not talk about the identity because we've covered that in detail this morning's talk on gender and identity. I want to talk to you about desire, love and sexual intimacy. Let's start with sexual desire. Firstly, what is desire? Sexual desire is driven by the hormone testosterone in your brain. This is for all of you who are listening. But particularly at teen age, this starts bubbling up at puberty. Boys have about five times testosterone as much as girls. Kind of explains some things. Now, what influences what we desire? It is biological, but it's also strongly influenced by what we put into our brain. So if we put in good things and pure things, our brain will be wired, it's called scripting, to desire good things. Remember what I told you earlier, the neuroplasticity. We put in things that aren't that good, like pornography, it wires the brain to think that is what is normal. Desire is a good gift from God. We already looked at that. Sex is a good gift. But it's very clear. The Bible tells us, be careful. Be careful. Handle it with care. Flee from sexual immorality, we are told. All other sins you commit are outside. But if you sin sexually, it is against our own body. Teach our children this. It is so very important. Secondly, we need to understand that there is an ordered and disordered desire. What is ordered desire? We've already talked about this. One man, one woman in marriage. The good story God has given us. What about disordered desire? I like to talk about two types of disordered desires. One object of desire is correct, that is male, female, but the context or expression is not in keeping with God's plan. We are looking at lust, pornography, hookup culture, affairs, harassment, rape, all this fits into. It may be male and female, but it's outside the context of one man, one woman in marriage, commitment for life. That's object. Now, can also have times when the object is not in keeping with God's desire for our life. 
Now, there we get the same sex attraction or sexual orientation other than heterosexual, one man, one woman, pedophilia, children, all sorts of sexual fetishes. I want to just pick two of these and discuss them briefly. One of it is pornography. Porn is any hypersexualized stimulus that hijacks and floods the dopamine circuits, the reward circuits in our brain. Quick fixes, just like this. That's why the cyber world becomes so seductive because it, it uses that by flooding the brain with dopamine. And when you masturbate to it, it fixes it, the opioid high. Now this brain neuroplasticity goes through stages. We call it the first one we call sensitization. Sensitization is when this hijacking begins to actually lay down neural pathways, neuroplasticity, and in your brain. So that after a while, your brain actually begins to only follow those pathways when you think of sex. It even lays down little place markers called delta V, a protein in your brain, so that sex becomes porn. Now you keep watching it. You keep watching it. These pathways and the cells get numb. They actually get numb. They're like, oh, this is too much. We call that desensitization. Now there is a decrease of this dopamine being produced. But your brain says, I want the stimulus. So you've got to give your more and more intense and varied stim stimulus and pornography. And then after a while, your brain, control brain actually shrinks. Your hypofrontal and you're moved into addictive territory. You see, good kids can get hooked on porn very easily. Currently, the average first exposure to porn is about 10 years and dropping. Children have a natural curiosity for the body. Even young children, the body responds when they see something that is sexual. And it affects the brain chemistry so quickly. What do kids do? These are good kids who recognize this is not a good thing. They, they are shamed. They hide because they think I am bad um, because I'm doing this. And meanwhile, it is warping their attitudes and their relationship. And they're beginning to accept that porn is what is normal when it comes to sex. And they keep watching. What can you do? Talk and train. And if you can't do it, talk to the parents, talk to your pastors, set up this program, talk to the children, teach them what to do. Teach them that if they see something, now this is little ones, if they see something with people without clothes or doing something that makes them feel uncomfortable, just say, this is not good. No, run away. Don't stay because your brain can get sucked in so easily. And always talk to someone. The debriefing is extremely important. Say no, run away, talk to someone. Put technology to work for you. Set filters, accountability software. There's lots of good software out there. And very importantly, follow it up. It's not a one-off. Keep talking to the children. And be prepared to deal with the problems if they arise. Because good kids can get sucked into porn. That's one thing. The right object, wrong context. What about the wrong object? I just want to talk about sexual orientation. For those of you who were there for the morning talk on gender and identity, we mentioned this, but I just want to run over it again. Sexual orientation is a feeling of attraction. It can be gay, les, bisexual, asexual, which means I basically don't feel any sexual 
attraction, which is kind of not fit in here, but never mind. And pansexual, which means I'm attracted to all sexes and all genders and basically anyone. Now, there's one very important thing we got to teach our children. Feelings are just that, a feeling. Physiology at teenage happens. Let me explain this. Children are confused that if you care deeply for someone, affection, love, you must be same-sex attracted, les or gay. I have children come and tell me, I'm, I really love my bestie. I guess I'm a lesbian. Wrong. You have a good friend. That's called friendship. At teenage, your response is very quick, the sexual response. And especially for boys, erections, even when not sexual, happen. So just because a boy feels an erection when he's with another boy does not mean he is gay. Erotic attraction is sexual desire, but it is a feeling. Teach children that feelings happen. Behavior, actually be it sexual or something else. I mean, I feel hungry. Am I going to gormandize by eating the whole of chocolate cake at evening tea? No. Maybe. But the reality is that behavior of sexual intimacy is always a choice. And choosing an identity self-label like gay, less, bi, pan, fluid, ace, that's asexual, is a choice. Please teach the children this because they hear from the culture that once you have a feeling, you must use it, you must have sex, it must be consummated and that's the only way you can be happy. Wrong. You can have a feeling and you can control the behavior. In fact, research tells us that there are lots of people who say, I have the feeling, but I don't live by it. And we know Christians who live that way. Born this way. I can't help it. I was born this way. Research tells us that for about, I don't know, there's a certain proportion, maybe half of the people who are same sex, there is some research basis of an innate predisposition for the feelings of same-sex attraction. Now, please note, a predisposition is not a predetermination for behavior. You may be predisposed to something, but you have a choice as to how you live out that behavior. So that is desire. We can talk a lot more about it. But I want to move into love and intimacy. The science behind it. Falling in love. Oh, some of you who are listening may remember that moment you fell in love. Oh, that heartbeat went up and you had that heart palpitating, pupil dilating. You, my darling, beloved belong in my arms feeling. It was this dopamine I've been talking about, getting sprayed all over your brain and basically making you dopey. When you fall in love, it's the dopiest thing you will ever do in your life. Your beloved becomes your very world. Other chemicals kick in, but dopamine drives it. And then... If you're sexually intimate, something else happens. You actually bind at a brain level. Oxytocin, vasopressin kick in. And it's like forming a super glue with the person you have sexual intimacy with. Explain this to your children. The power of love and the binding nature of intimacy couple of questions then we need to think about. Casual sex, the hookup culture, does it satisfy? 
all the research tells us, and I mean research, not just Christian research, although that is important, but the research coming from secular researchers tells us the sexual revolution leading to the hookup culture just doesn't work, especially for young girls. You see, because sexual intimacy is a binding act, the Bible tells us, and science reinforces that. See, there is a difference between love or even feeling desire for someone and lusting after that person. We should teach our children this. You see, love seeks the good of the other. Lust played out in pornography seeks selfish self-gratification not the seek the well-being of the other. We need to teach our children this. It is just so important that they understand this. Because our children are told, you just can't live a full life without sexual intimacy. Wrong on many, many grounds. Psalm 16 says, by your side, O God, I have perfect happiness, perfect satisfaction and joy. You can live a good life. You need mates. Mateship matters. Unfortunately, we live in a culture where non-sexual intimate friendships are devalued. Teach your children to value good friendship and to understand boundaries of intimacy. These are so blurred, especially in social media. We are sending a nudie to someone. It's like, okay, that's a sexually intimate act. Teach your children this. You see, we, they'll be learning consent at school, which just means get permission. You know what consent is? What's the lowest denominator I can get away with? We Christians look at a higher level of behavior. Consent is not what matters. It is about other focus caring that we teach our children. If I care for you that much that you are the important person in this relationship, why would I even need consent? I would never do anything that would make you unsafe or unhappy, or hurt you. See, we need to, even like Jesus did, did when he did the Sermon on the Mount, this is what you have heard, but I say, we need to be teaching our children a higher level of behavior than the world even expects of them. Then they will be the shining lights that will point people to Jesus. Like I said earlier, I'm leaving out the identity. We covered that in the morning session. So we've talked about the vulnerability of our kids. We've talked about how we can help them understand desire and love and intimacy. How we can pre pre prepare them to face the dangers of pornography. We need to challenge our children to dare to be different. When I speak to young people, I tell them, you know, you live in a world that teaches you that it is cool to have a gender label, to be sexually active, to get out there and live your desires. May I challenge you? Get out there and be out and proud. For Jesus, let us challenge our children to live like that. We have a number of books available to you. And the first book I wrote was called Teen Sex by the Book. This is a book that's written for teenagers, research-based. 
Growing Up by the Book is a book that we wrote for puberty, which is very important nowadays that children understand puberty. The Birds and Bees is for primary schoolers, for parents to read with their primary school kids. You and Me is for preschoolers, Birds and Bees for primary schoolers. Talking Sex is like a parent's how-to. And of course, the gender revolution is to talk about gender. Because I have so much of time on my hands, I also write novels. You can find those linked at my website or all of them are available on Amazon. Thank you. This is what I wanted to share with you today. But I just want to leave you with one message before I finish. And that is for your churches, if they wish to enroll in a short course of two sessions that I'm offering with Sandy Galea of KidsWise, you can go to KidsWise Equip or if you want to just scan that QR code right now or get in touch with me, I'm happy to send it. We have two sessions on two days one at the end of May and middle of June. And you are happy to, uh, I'm happy for you to take that to your churches and invite people to enroll. It's completely online and it's extremely cheap. I can't remember how much. Thank you for allowing me to address you today. And I hope this talk has been of some use to every one of you. Thank you and God bless you all.